Okay, good afternoon, everybody, uh, and uh, welcome to today's uh, webinar on seat booking uh, for classes. Um, can I ask whoever it is to mute? Uh, there we go. Um, this session is being recorded and will be available uh, afterwards. Um, if you've got questions, then feel free to um, stick them in the uh, in the chat function, um, and uh, we'll ask, respond to them uh, either uh, at the end of that uh, speaker's um, session or uh, or at the end, uh, depending on um, the relevance. Um, and um, Feel free to uh, talk to each other on that as well. Um, so to um, start with, um, we um, have got uh, Mira from uh, the Department of Transport um, who will uh, give us a uh, an introduction. Um, and then we've got um, four different uh, operators that are going to talk to us about um, the work that they've been doing recently. Um, and then um, we'll uh, we'll wrap up with uh, with some questions and finish by um, one o'clock. Um, some of you um, are um, names that uh, that I don't uh, recognise. Um, and so uh, it's worth just uh, touching on uh, on Arctic. Thank you for um, joining and uh, and uh, showing some interest in what we're doing. We're a uh, trade body um, or an industry body for public transport technology stakeholders. Um, we've got um, members from across the whole uh, sector, from uh, authorities through to operators suppliers and consultants and um, we encourage um, best practice in public transport um, particularly focusing on information and um, real time uh, we've got a, a library of uh, standards and guides and things like that available for members some of those are available for non-members as well and we work with uh, with members and and the wider industry to uh, to try and um, make sure that um, transport public transport technology and information um, helps customers um, and the industry um, as much as possible. Um, so that's a bit about Artig. Um, Mira um, will uh, give us um, a bit of an introduction. Mira, welcome. Um, hi, Tim. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, thanks for inviting DFT to open the session. Um, I'll make it quick because um, I suspect many of you are here to, uh, to listen to the really interesting case studies and, and work that's being delivered across the industry. But I suppose just to set the scene from a DFT perspective, um, the reason why we've um, shown some interest in um, the concept of pre-book pilots is it's been really triggered partly by COVID. Um, so earlier this year, um, just as we were about to emerge from um, lockdown, and Secretary of State was very keen to, um, to, to get to the transport sector moving again, and we were trying to think of different um, solutions and different ways we could support public transport operators to start offering their services whilst also providing passengers with the reassurances they needed that they would be able to get a seat on buses and that they wouldn't be um, essentially boarding crowded vehicles. And so, so so uh, one of the solutions that was presented to us after a round table with the transport technology sector was a solution um, so it was put forward by um, Eto World who work with us on um, bus open data and essentially their, their, their concept was such that um, 
overcrowding on public transport networks is really just a symptom of an imbalance between supply and demand. And actually what you really need to do is just manage that problem first before you actually get to the world of the vehicles being crowded and then having to give passengers information telling them that the vehicle is crowded. You could just solve the problem for much further upstream through the provision of crowded um, essentially um, pre-book systems. Um, we thought it was actually a really interesting take on the solution. There was definitely a lot of interest in it as a solution. There were definitely some implementation challenges that would need to be worked through. And I think fundamentally what it boils down to is, is that for the bus sector, this would be what we call a significant transformational change. Um, in this country, we run a turn up and go um, local transport and bus system particularly. Um, so people just turn up at their bus stop, they can flag down the bus um, and off they go, um, no need to, to book in advance. And definitely some nervousness from the sector about um, that level of, of transformational change at a national level. And I think that's absolutely right. Um, however, what it has done is, I suppose, accelerated some of the thinking around this and um, helped us think about whether and when and how pre book um, solutions might be suited or might be right for the bus industry and um, so we are at the moment engaging with different operators different authorities who are running their own pre-book pilot and um, what we're really interested to do is understand how those pilots work and I suppose the reason why we're interested is that yeah it's absolutely right that we do offer turn up and go systems at the moment um, for, for, for our pack our existing patronage space but actually if as a sector we want to survive and thrive and grow in a, an increasingly digitally transformed sector and we want to appeal in particular to our to our younger segment who actually form the, the largest segment of bus passengers but actually if you look at the transport focus research and um, report that they just don't feel that bus services are really designed for them in the way that they want to 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 consume those products and services they want you know taking the bus to be um in the words of transport focus as easy as ordering the pizza they want it to be digital they want it to be intuitive straightforward and so i think you know i think there is a real need for us as an industry to look at how we innovate how we listen to different customer bases and how we appeal to new customer bases as well and that's why we think the concept of pre-book pilots is a really interesting one and, and we do want to and um, start a discussion with the industry, which Arctic have very kindly enabled and facilitated through their channels um, and um, understand how these different pilots are working um, and then really start to, to help operators and local authorities think about whether these solutions are going to be right for them in the future. And um, so that's probably all I think I need to say at this stage. Yep. Thank you, Mira. Um... Thank you for that. Um, as you say, there's been a number of um, pilots um, running um, and we're going to hear from um, a number of uh, them. Um, one of the longer running pilots um, is actually uh, Stagecoach East Midlands. Um, and we're lucky enough to, uh, to have Dave Skepper, the MD, um, of, uh, of Stagecoach East Midlands with us um, today um, and he's going to uh, talk to us about the work that they've been doing um, in Hull and um, other areas in the East Midlands um, on, uh, on demand responsive shuttle services. Dave, welcome. Good afternoon, Tim. Um, you promoted me a bit there. I'm the commercial director for Stagecoach East Midlands. Um, um, but good afternoon to everybody, and um, thanks um, for giving me the opportunity to talk about our um, small project here at East Midlands, focused on providing NHS transport during the uh, COVID period. I'm really conscious that I'm talking to some smart, technically minded people, and um, I'm not an IT person. I'm a, a good old-fashioned busman. And perhaps the sort of person who has to um, ask for help from the grandchildren to work a mobile phone. But nevertheless, I can see obviously the huge benefits from bringing um, technology to uh, transport. Um, the, the 
the, the um, innovation it brings and the new experience it brings for the customer. Um, and even though I'm not um, a, a technical person, we have great support here from the technology team at, at Stagecoach with um, the technology that we, we're putting in place. Um, just a quick bit of background about East Midlands. Um, Tim, if you uh, can move on for us. Um, we're the region's um, largest bus operator, um, 480 buses covering the, the area, the Greater East Midlands area, and we just um, push into Yorkshire there, into East Yorkshire, into Hull. Got some really strong partnerships with uh, our local authorities and key stakeholders. Um, that includes the bids, the local authorities, major employers. Um, obviously, we're intrinsically linked with the Lincolnshire County Council, which is one of the pioneers of um, demand responsive transport with the Interconnect Network, which has been going um, since the end of the 90s um, and concentrates on demand responsive feeding the main bus network. Our focus over the last couple of years has definitely been on um, encouraging people to regularly use buses for commuting and for leisure travel. Um, as we work with local authorities to try and reduce um, congestion and promote sustainable transport. Um, and as part of that, we introduced our smart commute um, scheme across the East Midlands with major employers um, to give discounted um, bus passes to um, staff of major employers um, and they pay monthly through payroll. Um, up to the COVID period, we had about 1,200 people um, involved in that in the East Midlands. Um, and that was really helping us to um, encourage modal shift. Um, and we had 260 people in the schemes who were with the NHS. Um, and most uh, major hospitals do have a car parking problem. So trying to encourage staff to travel in a more sustainable way um, helps the environment, but also frees up space for those places um, to, to provide them parking for people who probably don't have um, public transport options to get, get, get there if they're travelling long distance. We move on. Um, the COVID period, Tim, if you just nudge, nudge it on for us, please. Um, the catalyst to doing the NHS um, shuttles was really the um, coronavirus outbreak um, in the East Midlands, like uh, most bus companies across um, the UK. The lockdown caused a dramatic fall in, in bus passenger numbers um, and to mitigate um, the effects of that um, we scaled back the, the bus network and really concentrating on the main core services um, seven till seven and what we were concerned about was um, effectively people um, getting to and from work during those core hours um, we were uh, concerned about the effects on key workers, though, key N N NHS workers, particularly for the homeward journey, um, because um, they effectively had good service in the daytime, um, but getting home when services were thinner in the evening um, was probably going to be more difficult on a reduced service network. So we um, found that the effective solution to that was probably to position the bus um, at each major hospital site to run on an on-demand basis. So if we can move on, Tim. And what we introduced was um, some free shuttles to take people home. So we decided to position a bus at each of our major hospitals that had a commuter plan scheme. Um, the one at Mansfield at Kings Mill, um, Holroyd Infirmary, um, and the Di Diana Princess of Wales Hospital in Grimsby. Um, it was a really simple form of demand responsive and um, passengers simply got on the bus and told the driver where they wanted to go and he or she made up um, a route to try and get them quickly to where they wanted to be. Um, and we worked with the NHS to try to optimise the departure times from the hospital site. So we ran in the main urban area, but we left um, for approximately every hour from three o'clock in the afternoon till about quarter past ten at night. Um, to take people home, but try to ensure that those departure times coincided with the end of most people's shifts. We operated the service with large buses for obvious reasons for social distancing purposes, and because of the nature of it, we put regular drivers on it who knew the terrain, um, who could um, effectively decide the most um, quickest route to get people back back home. And that, that service um, picked up pretty quickly once work got around at the hospitals and we were carrying around about 25 people a day um, by the time we promoted that 
and through the through the um, hospital's intranets. But of course, we then started to get requests saying from people saying, "Well, it's great for getting home, but um, you know, we would also like to be able to get into work in the morning." And actually, some people who had the choice to use a car um, said that they would use the service if it ran in both directions. Obviously, the the, the main um, obstacle there was to try to um, find a mechanism to allow people to book the journey um, for the morning the morning routes into into work. So we partnered up with um, Sherwood Forest Hospitals and we just started a commuter plan with them and timing wasn't great because it, it started in the January as, as, as we started to, to move into this um, COVID period in, in March. Um, but working with them, um, the County Council, Nottingham County Council um, and our, our own stagecoach team and the supplier Viavan um, we worked on creating a dedicated booking app to allow people to book um, journeys to travel into um, hospital in, in the morning. Um, as I say, we promoted that through the NHS um, intranet and they had, in a lot of cases, the hospitals had their own social media, so they promoted it quite heavily. Um, NHS could, staff could download the um, Connect app from the App Store and from Google Play create an account um, and then select to be able to have pickups and drop-offs based around the departure and arrival time. So effectively our transport solution was a many to one. So everybody was traveling to and from the hospital at either end of the day. Um, on the app, um, people can make bookings um, up to a maximum of a week in advance um, or up to just one hour in advance and the system will shuffle riders and departure times um, to create that logical route um, but to, to keep the window of people within a 15 minute um, estimation of the of the original booking time. Um, the system ad, ad, ad reminds people of their uh, book departures by sending them messages um, and then um, the user can actually track the vehicle and to see where it is so that they can actually pinpoint their arrival time. Again, if we can move on, Tim. Um, effectively, the, the Kings Mill shuttle, we had to do some work um, with the with Biovan and the mapping system. So we had our schedulers go through the local terrain in Mansfield and identify roads that weren't suitable for large vehicles and scope them out of the out of the mapping to make sure that we ran um, down a suitable route. Um, we also um, made the system focus on named bus stops so people effectively go to the nearest bus stop um, to catch their service um, into work and the time is given from that stop. Again, we'd established a team of, of regular drivers. Um, we were putting in the, this in pretty quickly so we had to gather some training sessions um, and over a couple of days um, the regular drivers had to get familiar with the system and how it worked. Um, but the, the way that they picked it up showed that it was relatively easy to use, both from a user's point of view and also from people operating, operating the service. The trial was supported by Stagecoach and the County Council um, working alongside um, the NHS Trust. Um, and we wanted to use it really for two purposes, obviously to provide this essential transport for um, NHS staff but equally to evaluate the um, technology that we were, we were using um, for the first time in the, in the East Midlands. So we launched it on the 18th of May. Um, two buses started operating in the morning for ships arriving between five and eight o'clock in the evening. And we continued with the um, homeward journeys between quarter past three and quarter past 10 in the evening. And we ran the service seven days a week. It's free to, to NHS staff. So they simply produced their ID card and um, to travel, but it did include providing travel for ancillary workers, so cleaners, porters, medical staff, that kind of thing. Buoyed up by the success that we had in um, Mansfield, we, we had commuter plans in Hull and Grimsby. So we talked to the NHS trusts there and also to our local authority um, colleagues about establishing a, a, a similar service. So working with the Hull University Teaching Hospital and the Northern Lincolnshire NHS Trust, we established services at both of these sites as well, worked on a similar basis, similar operating times and similar resources. Interestingly, the, the Hull one was working with um, two buses the same as the, um, as the Mansfield one, but covering a much bigger area, 
but because we divided the city into two halves, kind of an east and a west, that seems to have worked in terms of, of keeping journeys down, principally because the hospital is right in the centre of, of the city. And so um, you can create quite logical routes in terms of, of, of going around each side of the city. So in terms of our performance, um, we have, we've had some really, really, really good results. We've established um, some regular customers. Obviously, we've increased um, the ridership on the services, as you can see here. Um, our um, demand, we were meeting the demand um, for the journeys. We were managing to keep journey times pretty short. Um, so in most cases, kind of around the 15 to 20 minutes. Um, that was pretty important to try and make sure that it was comparable with a typical car journey in and out of work. The ratings for the app out of five, really, really good, and for the service overall, 4.9, and getting some good feedback from customers and, and some good PR. But of course, most importantly, um, helping a vital group of, of, of staff get to and from work at a really, really difficult time. And in that as well, there was some evidence of modal shift um, for people actually moving from using a car to using this service because they didn't actually see it as being a conventional bus service. It was something very much different. Final slide. So our next steps, really, the, the project was planned as always being um, a short term um, solution while bus services were reduced. Um, it was principally there to provide convenient tra travel for NHS staff. Um, and we, we knew that we would be working towards some point when normal services started to come back in and, and perhaps the, the, the you know, solution would step back. But there's been great positivity around it from the NHS trusts and from the staff. So we've started a dialogue with all of the trusts to explore um, the options for this type of transport, particularly within a health environment and to see what opportunities there may be for that in the future. In the meantime, um, the technology itself has been rolled out on a more permanent basis with the, the Tees Flex service up in the northeast, um, which is um, a, a more typical demand responsive service running for the members of the public across that region. And, and we're talking to our own transport officers here about Stagecoach Connect and the concept um, to see if there are opportunities to develop a similar style to the interconnect service that we have in Lincolnshire in other places, but using this, this new demand um, technology, which requires very little um, intervention from a central a central control um, centre. So that's really the concept and a really brief overview of it. Obviously, I'm happy to answer some questions in terms of the operational side of things. Um, I think, Tim, that um, at some point you're, you're probably going to be talking to some of the suppliers and, and no doubt people have the opportunity to ask the more technical questions and quite clearly if I can't answer any questions today I'm happy to take those back to our team at this end and to, to provide some guidance there. And thanks for listening. Thank you Dave, that was, uh, that was very uh, interesting. Um, do you see this um, being rolled out um, more widely for for stagecoach where you're operating around hospitals elsewhere in the country i think certainly it, it, this has provided the opportunity for us to get close to some of those trusts and understand more about what their transport requirements are we are a transport company um looking at um, mainly running conventional bus services but we have widened that that portfolio with um, new technology and i'm sure there are opportunities there and to use the Stagecoach Connect app to do more of this, this type of work. Mm -hmm. mm. Okay, thank you. Um, we've not got any uh, questions from the audience at the moment, so um, we'll move on. Thank you, Dave, um, for that. Um, next um, up, we've got... Um, a, a bit of a longer um, journey um, solution. Um, so Traws uh, Cymru in, uh, in Wales um, provide um, long distance um, journeys. Um, and um, we've got um, David Hall um, and a number of um, his colleagues um, who are going to um, 
talk to us about um, what they're up to. David, hello. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. And th thanks, Tim. Thanks for the introductions. And um, it's going to be a bit, a bit of a double act on this one with colleagues from Urban Things, who are our technology partner, helping us to roll out a new pre-booking app. So I think I'll be joined in a few minutes, hopefully, or rescued in a few minutes by colleague Carl Partridge from um, Urban Things. So a little bit of it, I'll do some general introductions to Charles Cymru. What, what what challenges we've got and why well, why we are looking at new technology to help us and I'll hopefully hand over to Carl to take everyone through some of the details about about the, the pre-booking system is that okay yeah that's yeah. good okay. Tim are you okay to help us with driving the the technology yeah of course okay and um, so I'm based in David Hall I'm based in the Welsh government um but we are teaming up with um urban things to roll out the pre-booking app on the long distance bus network thanks Tim, can you just take the next slide, please? Okay, that, that's that's one of that's one of our vehicles. So we've got a distinctive brand. The network is a long distance network, so it's a little bit different to what David at Stagecoach has just explained. It's not an urban network. It is essentially a long distance and bus network across Wales. Tim, next slide, please. The, the, net, the Charles Cymru network, those that, that are not familiar, does have a, a steep, a rich history. It is an iconic brand in Wales, has been running over 40 years. Started off as a limited stop express coach service, linking in key centres across Wales. But over the last few years, thanks to investment, we have increased the network and extent and have ch changed things slightly. That's the current network of services. We run seven services on key routes across Wales, some very long distance, um, such as the T4, which is 100 miles in length between Newtown and Cardiff, that down the eastern spine of Wales. We run services like the T1, Aberystwyth, Lampert and Carmarthen, which is essentially linking to railheads. So a lot, lot of the network, Charles Cymru Network, does serve principal settlements, which are served by, by the rail network in Wales. The next slide should show a map of the network. The, the white lines show the um, Charles Cymru services, the grey lines show the connect services. So we do have a reasonable spread of, of connections across Wales. The, the majority of services at the moment dif different to urban, the urban context because we're, we're, we are long distance and some of the routes are serving key centres in rural areas. The majority of our network does tend to operate hourly or services once every 120 minutes weekdays and Saturday day times with a, with a reduced service on Sunday. Um, compared to urban areas, patronage is relatively modest, but it has grown in recent years. Last financial year, we carried 2.46 million passengers, um, which was up quite considerably compared to previously when the network tended to carry about a quarter of a million passengers, but we have ramped up the network in recent years. The vast majority of passengers use the network to travel between major centres, especially those centres not, not connected by rail. 60% of passengers pay for the travel on, on cash fares, and that's very conventional at the moment. The majority of passengers turn up and go for a scheduled service, pay the driver, buy their ticket and travel, and 40% are travelling with concession travel passes. So even though it's a long distance bus coach network, it tends to, at the moment, run very traditionally using scheduled and um, timetable conventional services. And that's where some of the challenges, especially in the living with COVID era, take us. Yeah, that, there's just a colleague, there's just the, 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 um, the, the, the growth in passenger numbers over recent years. Thanks, Tim. Okay, the passenger profile. Um, at the moment, about 20% 20, 20 of our passengers are aged over 65 years of age across the network. 6% are aged under 18, 13% 18 to 24. Critically, 53% of passengers are aged 24 to 65. So there's a reasonable age spread of customers on the network. So the, the demographics would seem to tell us that pre-booking or pre-booking of tickets and seats would, would work on Charles Cymru. Critically, when I think when we asked Tim, just next slide, please. When we recently asked customers through social media to tell us whether or not they'd be willing to consider pre-booking, over 
percent of those passengers who responded in those high number said they would welcome the opportunity to book seats in advance and purchase their tickets and also seven percent said they would welcome Olympic stop services so that sets the scene so running a limit we're running a, a, a rural service on core routes outside the urban environment um, and as passenger numbers start to recover because we can carry less passengers on the vehicles because of physical and social distancing restrictions there's a real and genuine risk that we're going to have to start turning passengers away from the network because we couldn't accommodate them and obviously people are left on the side side of the road and because the service is relatively infrequent there's a genuine risk that people may be stranded overnight and key workers may not be able to get home so that caused some very different challenges to us so what we did is we, we, we teamed up with a company called urban things who are developing an app for us to try and address some of these issues and, and modernize the service thanks for that tim can i just hand over to carl now thank you thanks very much david um and thanks for the opportunity to talk a little bit more about um how we're going to be working with the welsh government uh to to trial and deliver on these challenges um i think if we can go a couple of slides forward tim Sorry, I feel quite rude bossing you around as the slide presenter, Tim, but I can't change them myself. Thank you. <laughs> um, okay, and we could go to the next slide. Um, so I'll I'll spare everyone the sales pitch. Um, for those of you that haven't heard of us, though, um, the company is called Urban Things. Um, we originally developed uh, Bus Checker, which is still the largest independent bus times app, and we provide white labelled offerings to the public and private sector. Uh, most recently, uh, we've been working with Transport for London, uh, Ipswich Buses and Newport Bus. And of course, please do feel free to go and find out more about us if anything we have to say um, appeals. Um, to move on to the next slide. So yeah, this is quite an interesting problem space for us. Um, it sits somewhere in between, you know, full fat demand responsive travel, but it doesn't quite go that far. Um, the Welsh Government still want to retain that essence of um, a turn up and go service. Uh, the outcome is obviously, as David says, to uh, restore passenger confidence in the system uh, and doing that via uh, guaranteed travel, uh, but also guaranteeing that you'll have a place on a socially distanced uh, vehicle, so managing capacity. Um, some initial observations of the network that we made. Uh, there's a shared topology, it's a multi-operator system, which obviously presents its own unique challenges for data and validation. Uh, a relatively low frequency service, um, which reduces the confusion or potential confusion of somebody booking onto one service and turning up and getting on the wrong one. Uh, there's no common validation method. Uh, the majority of the operators do have uh, the same make of ETM, they use Ticketo ETMs. Uh, and there's quite a strong bilingual uh, requirement as well. Um, um, so I'd like to very quickly step through the um, solution components and the passenger journey, um, which shouldn't take too long. There are three components to the proposed solution. Uh, there's a passenger app for uh, presenting real-time information, including uh, occupancy. Uh, there is a passenger website so the service can be accessed by uh, users who don't have access to a smartphone, bearing in mind that older demographic as well. And there's a cloud back office for managing the system. Uh, we're also able to offer as an optional component a driver app. Um, here are some pictures of the driver app that we recently uh, supplied uh, to Transport for London. Uh, we, we took part in a a vehicle tracking solution for TFL, for the Nightingale Hospital, uh, essentially sits on rugged devices mounted in the cab. And what that can do is actually allow a hybrid solution where a driver can support a turn up and go style service for walk on bookings. Uh, when you actually start to analyze the technicalities of the problem space, uh, it quickly becomes fairly complex to work in this sort of hybrid mode. Uh, so maybe if we have a future technical webinar, we can delve deeper into that. But essentially, you walk onto the, um, the service and you need to say where you're going to 
in order that the system can say whether there is sufficient capacity. Uh, in layman's terms, maybe there's a bunch of people getting on at the next stop pre-booked, so it's perhaps not as simple as it might at first seem. Um, moving on to the next slide. Uh, so the passenger experience itself, uh, the app uh, on both iOS and Android, uh, we present um, blended Siri feeds. So we take the vehicle position feeds. Uh, we can take the uh, stop centric feeds as well, blended together for the different operators. Uh, we're also supporting the new Siri VM extensions uh, that are coming from Ticketer at the moment. So the drivers are able to indicate how crowded the vehicles are. Uh, and we've recently uh, been working on a UK government funded product to generate our own future predictions of occupancy as well that we're able to use. Uh, plus, of course, the ability to see network maps, uh, other timetable information. So moving on to the ticketing and reservations piece, uh, which is on the next slide. So in its initial rollout, the system will support catalog based ticketing. Uh, passengers choose a ticket that can be a period pass or otherwise and then what we can do is we can flag certain tickets as being mandatory reservations so uh, if you bought one of those tickets the ticket can't be displayed unless you have a reservation so uh, you download the ticket it's securely locked to the device and then moving on to the next screen so the interface for passengers to actually make a booking uh, you can have a one-to-many relationship, so you can have one ticket with multiple reservations. Uh, and the information you need to make the booking is fairly self-explanatory. You need the service date, when are you traveling, and where are you going from and to. Um, the system will present passengers with the available trips. You can see how crowded each vehicle is, and then if there's enough capacity on a trip, you can then make a reservation. And then moving on to the next slide. So. The actual ticket validation experience uh, on the left we have how the system is going to work with the uh, ticketer etms so tickets will be validated via a qr reader um, and the reservation itself uh, it's up to the driver to inspect to make sure the passenger is reserved on the correct service and the app itself will take care of making sure that expired reservations can't be displayed uh, on the right um, we're hoping that the system will roll out nationally next year. So for operators who don't have a QR reader, uh, we have a technology called uh, the Hextag, which has been very interesting. We have that deployed in uh, places like Lancashire and Cambridgeshire at the moment on coach operators. And what that means is that you can place a QR code sticker on the vehicle, and then the passenger effectively scans their way onto the vehicle. And what that does is it generates a check-in event, so it allows the system to understand who's actually on the vehicle. We can also detect no-shows. And then one of the future potential uses of that data is that we can begin to uh, potentially uh, look out for people who make a reservation and then don't show up. And you can even potentially uh, stop them booking or at least place a limit on that. Uh, I think there's probably two more slides. So moving on to the next one, in terms of governance and oversight, the cloud back office allows either the operators or the Welsh government to do capacity planning. You can see who's booked onto which route. Again, this is it's quite interesting to compare this with the, the Viavan solution because this sits somewhere in between. It allows running the, um, the fixed route scheduled turn up and go service in line with, um, in addition to pre-bookings. So you can actually see those scheduled routes and do capacity planning. Uh, and then in terms of revenue disbursement, uh, that's always an interesting challenge. Uh, in its initial incarnation, it's obviously a multi-operator scheme, so we will be doing revenue apportionment based on ticket, but there is the ability for the system to actually move to a usage-based apportionment where we can actually sell single tickets spanning multi-operators, and we will reimburse that directly to the operator's bank accounts. Um, the driver app, we've already discussed, you, you can see who's getting on and off at each stop. Uh, we have the option for school services to provide a passenger manifest as well, so you can actually see who you're picking up. Um, and then finally, in terms of where we're hoping to take this, we're obviously in discussions with the government to understand where David and his colleagues would like to go with this next year. 
Um, we've discussed QR on vehicle, usage-based apportionment, uh, predicted occupancy. Uh, the only one I haven't covered is perhaps that some of the smaller operators don't have a Siri SM feed. So we are also able to use the driver app as part of the solution to generate vehicle tracking and then generate predicted arrival times. Um, we hope to roll it out nationwide in 2021. Uh, the limited trial uh, of four operators on four routes uh, on, on a couple of dozen vehicles uh, will be going live in the next few weeks. Um, and then to throw back to you, David, but thank you for the opportunity to talk you through it. Yeah, thanks, Carl. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. Yep. Okay. Thank you both for that. Um, we've got a question. Um, I suspect it's um, uh, more for, uh, for for urban things. Um, why has a native app been chosen rather than the responsive website? Uh, yeah, happy to tackle that. Um, we're actually doing both is the quick answer. Um, so for passengers who don't have a smartphone, there is a responsive website. Um, but our history is mobile and, and a smartphone is very rich in sensor, sensor data. So it allows us to access, for example, uh, Bluetooth beacons, it allows us to deliver a faster, more responsive experience to passengers. But the short answer is we are doing both. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we now um, move from uh, from longer distance services in Wales to uh, to, to to Newport um, in Wales, where um, we've got um, Ben Hutchinson from Transport for Wales, um, who will uh, uh, talk to us about um, what uh, he's up to. Thank you, Tim. Uh, is that visible for everybody? Yes. Cool. Good. I can drive my own slides then. You can have a rest. <laughs> <laughs> thank, you. Um, thank you for thank you for inviting us to uh, to talk. So we've um, we've been planning some demand responsive pilots for quite a long time in Wales, and we were due to go live on the first of April. Um, and our focus was going to be the really rural areas where there may not be a public transport option for people. Um, and then COVID struck, and uh, along with all other aspects of normal life, our pilots were suddenly um, suspended. Um, what we what we saw was an opportunity to try and do something very different, to move from rural areas into urban areas where um, the scheduled buses had been decimated. People wanted some certainty that they weren't going to be sitting uh, on top of a bunch of other people, and they wanted to be able to book book their trips. And it's been a really interesting um, few months, actually. Um, I guess the, the 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 first thing to say is that um, we are different, I think, from most other demand responsive transport services because we're not providing this as an operator; we're providing it as the transport authority. Um, and actually, it, it it leads to quite a different type of solution and quite different dynamics. Most of the implementations of demand responsive transport are an operator who goes and um, pairs up with via van or uh, shuttle or whoever. Um, and the sort of back office tools and all of that is kind of geared around there's a one to one between operator and route. Because we're buying it as a transport authority, we potentially got multiple operators. And in fact, we've got many operators using the system at the moment. And it drives a slightly different behavior. You start to think about things like how you broker um, for capacity and whether you can bring in other um, other operators. So, you know, I think, you know, demand responsive transport has been done quite a lot. We're using Via Van for the pilot, and that's, you know, well established. I think most people are familiar and Stagecoach has already spoken about uh, about the use of that in the East Midlands. But actually, we're we're viewing it from a slightly different angle. So we started off with Newport um, and we took two routes. One of them was a previously commercial route. One of them was a supported route uh, and put demand responsive on there. Um, we've been absolutely bowled over by the demand though. We've now got Cardiff, Ronda, Prostatin, Denby all live. Um, we've got Colwyn Bay about to go live and we've got another three or four that are, that are on the way. Um, 
Newport is very keen to see what we're doing expand to the whole of the city, which would be a really exciting thing. Um, and we've got a range of existing operators for community transport and demand responsive services across Wales who are also really interested. And I think, again, this is, I suppose, the big difference between running it as a transport authority and running it as an operator. Actually, there's a huge latent demand out there um, for technology to support existing services. There are loads of demand responsive services around them. And there was that thing on Sky um, uh, a couple of months ago with the 1974 uh, first demand responsive service. It's not a new idea. The thing which is new and the thing which actually needs a real kick, I think, is the technology behind it. Because a lot of people are still running contact center based, book the day before type services, dial a ride. And, you know, the technology is out there to do this in in so much better ways, so much slicker from a passenger perspective, so, so much richer data from an operator perspective. Um, and, and on that, I mean, actually what we've found is people really, really like it. And I know, I know this is sort of, uh, you know, demand response to transport was always popular. And in fact, even the 1974 one was popular. Um, but actually we're finding over two thirds of passengers are using the app, um, which is really interesting. It's huge sort of, uh, people worry so much about people over 20 not being able to use a smartphone for things. Um, but you know, as, as, as Carl has just said, and David have just said with, with Trouse, actually most people are pretty happy with this. Uh, it's interesting, we've, we've just replaced all the concessionary smart cards in Wales. Um, and we provided um, a paper application form or an online application form. This is concessionary, so this is over 60s and disabled people. 95% of the applications we got were electronic over the web. So, you know, actually people, people are willing to embrace technology if they can see a benefit, and there is a direct benefit here. And you can see, I mean, this is just the first few weeks of operation, but Flexi grew hugely. Uh, you know, if you look at Flexi services compared to fixed line buses, uh, we were seeing a really disproportionate use of the demand responsive service. And interestingly, we've put a scheduled bus back on the same route now. Um, Flexi is still outperforming the scheduled bus, and we didn't see much of a dent in the demand when the scheduled bus went back on. So a really strong, strong requirement. Now, I mean, the, the the other thing which is which is well known and rehearsed with um, uh, with demand responsive is it's great, people like it, but it's expensive. Um, we're currently providing um, flexi without any operating subsidy in all of the areas. Um, that's possible because there's emergency funding um, for for bus services and the patronage is down anyway. But the running costs can still be higher. So, um, you know, in, in some areas, Newport, for instance, the mileage is about 50% higher than the scheduled bus. Um, and in fact, there was interworking with other routes, which, which there isn't anymore. Um, in other areas like Cardiff, actually it's around about the same as the scheduled service. We think Flexi is likely to need some subsidy when, uh, when passengers start to come back uh, and, uh, and the scheduled services start to fill up and so become more efficient. But actually, you know, all the feedback we're getting is it's a much more inclusive service. And particularly when you get out to the rural areas, you know, it may be the only public transport option for a number of people. So there are there are other reasons. Um, I, I've worked a lot in rail. Um, I run the rail procurement in Wales. And, you know, the, the difference in subsidy expectations in rail and bus, you know, with what we're talking about here is small change in rail terms, but would benefit an enormous number of, of people who currently have no, no option. Um, so we're looking at a range of things to improve operating efficiency. And I, I mean, the first thing, um, and this is absolutely central, you know, it's, it's, it's lovely. People expect um, Uber, you know, they expect people to say, I'm here, I want to travel as soon as possible to here, come and pick me up, and they expect the bus to turn up in five minutes. Well, I mean, that's great, but that is Uber, and it's expensive. Um, 
So we've got, you know, if, if you take a demand responsive service out of the box, you, you end up with um, essentially a minibus providing an Uber service. You, you're chasing demand. We do get aggregation. Um, but actually, we think the future for this is, is a slightly more constrained semi-scheduled service where you can plan the bus movements um, and uh, people have to fit in and shape their journeys around those bus movements. Now, I mean, you can still ramp up and down the capacity, um, but we think it's, it's basically a much more efficient service. When you start getting to rural Pembrokeshire, though, or Conway Valley or, um, you know, some of the re really rural areas, you just have to semi-schedule services you couldn't provide um, unless you've got unlimited funding, a service to a rural area without some structure to it. You know, it's basically going to go from St. David's to Haverford West at this time, back at this time, but it covers a polygon rather than a, a fixed route. Um, scale is really important, we think. Um, and actually the Newport service, the reason why we want to scale it up is because you know, if you were trying to run a taxi service limited to a three mile radius, you've got um, you've got huge overheads, um, not much um, flexibility. So we think scaling up actually will, will be good. Um, we want to try and get more efficient vehicles on it. So at the moment we're using sort of Opta solo type vehicles. Um, that's great because of um, making uh, making sure people aren't sitting too close to one another. Um, but actually, and, and they're there, but actually, if this is a longer term thing, we need much more efficient vehicles, and particularly in urban areas, we think EVs um, has probably got a strong business case. Um, dynamic capacity has been an interesting one, and this is where I think the brokerage idea is going to come in. You know, actually, you get really rich data when you start providing demand responsive services. You have the kind of the, the, the holy grail of origin destination data on everybody's journeys. Um, but you also spot there are busy times, and those busy times are different on different days of the week, uh, depending on the weather and all sorts of other things. We think that we should be able to tune the capacity um, to match the demand much more dynamically, and um, potentially start using things like private hire or alternative operators or, uh, or whatever else to help serve the peaks in demand in much the same way that Uber or others will. So people can log on. Um, and we think, you know, community transport could play a role in this, a significant role in this, um, to, to try and sort of get the get the capacity flexed much more. And finally, and um, Carl spoke about this, you know, actually we, we need to make sure that the fixed line services and flexi are properly coordinated. So, um, you know, for instance, um, we've talked about Siri VM feeds. Well, we'd like those to go into the booking services here so that you can see if there are fixed line services you can walk to, um, real time information on those, or you can get a demand responsive, which might mean walking in the opposite direction or waiting a little bit longer or whatever. We think there's a role for both, but they do need to be coordinated and they need to be complementary. So, you know. The future of it um, is currently it's an app based service or a phone based service. Um, those are all set up as, as bilingual services now. We're developing a, a sort of web interface into it as well. And this is what it could look like, you know, as a kind of semi scheduled service. So it's a much more conventional sort of journey planner view of things. Um, and it shows how things are constrained. It's not anywhere to anywhere at any time. But we think this will be much better. It'll give people um, more of an ability to have certainty about going out and coming back at a particular time. And we, we're using the API from Viavan to integrate this into the app so that you can you can use web or app based. Um, we're also about to go out to procure um, because Viavan has been great. Uh, I mean, actually, a really superb team there. Um, they've you know we got the first thing up and running in a couple of weeks. Uh, bilingual everything in a couple of weeks, which is astonishing. Um, but you know, it is just a pilot. We we rush that procurement through to get something up and running very quickly. So we're going to be going out to procure uh, a platform in the future. Um, and you know, there are, there are many other companies that could provide the software. So we'll be we'll be doing a proper market tool. Um, and starting to look at really rural areas to get a, a more 
um, a more balanced view of urban DRT, rural DRT. But I think, you know, the key thing um, is there's, there is, as I say, an enormous amount of pent up demand for the tools and taking the tools away from the operator and making it something which we can make available to a range of operators seems to be really gaining traction in a way that I don't think we expected. And to have gone from, you know, no implementations when COVID struck at the beginning of May to um, five, about to be six, with another three committed, um, you know, we've, we've been we've been really surprised and really delighted. So that, that's 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 all I was going to say, Tim. I don't know. I haven't got visibility of questions. I don't know if you if you do. Um, yeah, thank you, uh, Ben, for that. Um, there are no questions that have uh, come in. Um, I think the the thing that you found with uh, with the digital use from uh, from particularly the older generation is is fascinating and something that uh, that that is very encouraging for uh, for being able to roll this sort of thing out more widely um because uh, uh, if you have to provide telephone services and paper services and things like that it starts to get an awful lot more expensive and and sluggish and um less responsive to people's needs at the last minute so uh, i think it's very interesting what you've been doing um We'll now um, move on um, slightly further south than uh, than, than Ben um, across the uh, the Bristol Channel um, down into uh, First Group and uh, and the West of England operation where we've got um, Rob Pym, who's the commercial director down there, that's going to talk to us about what he's been doing. And there's been quite a lot of um, coverage of this in the press, which is uh, it's uh, going to be very interesting to hear what he uh, has to say. Hi Tim, thanks for the introduction and hi everyone. I'm conscious of time so I'll try and yeah. keep it relatively brief. Um, oh good, you've picked up the slides Tim. So, so yeah, I think a lot of what you, what the previous presenters have said have kind of resonated in terms of some of the stuff that we've been thinking about or we've had to kind of grapple with but I think Initially, we, we conceived this as a kind of a COVID response in terms of that imperative around um, capacity constraints due to social distancing and trying to address people's anxiety of, of whether they, they get a seat. So yeah, as quickly as we can, we, we brought this to market. I just want to give you a, a quick flavor of, of where we're at. So if you just flick it on, Tim, please. Yeah, I think, you know, right from Mira's um, presentation at the start, the premise was quite quite clear at the start. We're, we're running less than 50% of the normal seats on each bus at the moment. Um, you know, all, all the research that you read, you know, anxiety is, is out there in terms of uh, people wondering whether they're going to get a seat. Now, clearly, it's not very acute at the moment. There's a bit of a phony war at the moment in terms of, you know, why would you launch a booking service when everyone's on holiday and, and, and the buses, let's face it, are still quite empty. Um, but we think, we hope, clearly things are going to ramp up in the in the autumn. And I think, you know, that use case, even post COVID, if I could use that expression where, you know, Bristol is renowned for, in particular, having full buses during the, the morning and the evening peaks, you know, why wouldn't you welcome the, the opportunity to, to book a space rather than you know, running the lottery of whether whether you're going to get on the bus. So just over the, on the right of that slide, we've, you know, we at first, we've, I'm sure like a lot of you guys, tried to use technology as, as quickly as we can to respond to the, the crisis. So um, in chronological order there on the right, we, we've developed our app so that you can now see the bus on the map and you can see how many, how many seats are available in real time, including the, the wheelchair space. Um, we've put book my bus ride live, which I'll, 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 I'll develop in more detail. And then most recently, we've put our so-called space checker website live, which basically kind of aggregates the data to give people a view across the day 
based on the service and the stop they want to views of, of where the busy parts of the day are because the traditional concept of the peak in our business has really been blown out of the water you could get on a bus at two o'clock in the afternoon it'll be busier than the one at eight o'clock in the morning at the moment so i think you know the, the lady from the dft at the start said you know let's try and make best use of what we got so trying to steer people into the quieter periods will will make those socially distant seats go go further so so a real kind of technological response from us so far so just just going on tim so we've gone down the the website route initially it was kind of a a pragmatic thing whereby we had a we had a development going on internally anyway for another part of our uh, business over in Ireland. So we, we managed to piggyback um, onto an existing website development, which was actually around booking booking coaches over in Dublin. Um, so we were, we were able to get this out there relatively quickly, at, let's face it, relatively low cost at a time when, you know, CapEx on sort of big app, big app developments is, is, is necessarily quite constrained at the moment. So so we launched on the 27th of July. So we've been live for what we're into the fourth fourth week now. Uh, we've had a lot of great support from, from Weka, the West of England Combined Authority, who kind of oversee our area spanning sort of Bath, Bristol, Western Supermare out in, in the West. Um, so it's really been a joint effort with those guys. And we put the website live on the 27th. And Basically, it's a point-to-point -point booking system along a normal registered bus route. And you can book a single or a return trip up to seven days out uh, from when you want to depart. And at this stage, we've used a model where there's no additional cost. So, you know, we've not got into any, any fancy price segmentation or, or any differential pricing. At this stage, we're saying you can pay a normal fare when you book. Or if you've already got a ticket, because the vast majority of our customers buy tickets in advance, just use that ticket when you board, and you, there won't be an additional charge when when you book your space. I always use the word space because you're not booking a specific seat. Obviously, you're not you know, you're not saying I want uh, the third seat back by the window. This is just a space on the bus. Um, we've put it live on three routes so far probably a little bit of science behind, you know, why we chose those routes, but also a little bit of sort of pragmatism about where we thought it, it would work best given the speed with which we were doing it. So we've gone for, for an interurban route, which is from Thornbury, which is to the north of Bristol, to those, for those of you that don't know, down into, down into Bristol. That's typically quite a heavy commuter route, if I could put it like that. Um, then we've gone for a park and ride service and more of an urban service in Bath, which is our three, what we call 3B service now, because it's bookable. But that, I guess the USP on that one was that it serves a hospital, which uh, some of the previous presenters have noted, of, you know, particularly in the early days of the crisis, you know, key workers was a big, a big consideration. So having a booking service that kind of interacts with a, with a hospital was, was part of the reason why we chose that. So, so I'd, so I'd very much call it a, it's kind of a toe in the water. You know, we've, we've put it live on three routes. Um, we've piggybacked, you know, an, an existing opportunity to, to not spend too much money on it. And, and really it's about proving the concept as far as we're concerned, um, you know, before we get too excited about, you know, big investment. Uh, you know, it's live in West of England at the moment in, in Bath and Bristol, but, you know, we've got 14 other operating companies in in first bus so you know if we can prove that there's demand for it operationally we can make it work technologically we can we can make it work then i guess we start to get more more ambitious about would other operating companies uh, like to take it but for now we're we're the guinea pigs within within first um if you just move on tim So yeah, I think I referred to it as the phony war. I think until we get into September and things start picking up through the autumn, you know, when capacity truly starts getting more constrained with the return of the schools, we've got a big university market in 
in the west of England, then that's the point at which I think, you know, we prove whether this thing has got has got legs or not. For now, we're just bedding it in. Um, so we're doing a four week trial of each pilot route. So we're just about to do sort of the first kind of post implementation review next week for the route that went live first. And then we'll be doing that for the other two routes as well. Um, I think what we put live, you'd probably call a, an MVP plus. So we, we kind of, it, it was the minimum viable product, probably with a, a few more bells and whistles that we managed to squeeze in. But there are a few functional tweaks that uh, we've kind of spotted at the outset that we can make at, at relatively low cost. So they're currently being uh, built for implementation in, in September. Um, whether we expand the offer then all depends on how things go um on the pilot routes into the autumn um the end game that you could envisage would be integration into the app so you can you can plan a journey on our app uh, you can see where the seats are you can book your ticket you know you can bring the ticket up on your phone and board with a qr code um what you can't do at the moment is, is book that space so logically, you, you would probably do that as part of the user experience in the app kind of hemisphere rather than having to break out into this, this separate uh, website. Uh, and then there's all sorts of stuff from a kind of an operational and driver perspective around, you know, ticket machine in, uh, integration. You know, at the moment, the, the driver doesn't know who's booked to get on and off at each stop. Uh, we can cope with that at the moment because things are quite quiet, but eventually we'll have to think about how we how we might integrate this more seamlessly from a kind of an operational perspective. So I think, as you said, Tim, we, we've had some pretty good PR. I think there's a lot of interest out there, um, which is always helpful. Um, you know, the test now is whether we can turn that into a viable uh, product that, that kind of earns its earns its keep and earns its place in our in our suite of um, technology so yeah it's early days but yeah we're, we're very excited we you know i'm really excited to see next month and onwards whether where the booking really does take off in a kind of a normal bus city bus environment um so we will see so that's that's just a brief flavor of of where we're at in the, in the west of england with with book my bus ride Thank you, Rob. Um, that was uh, very interesting. Uh, I, I think what you're doing there um, is is much more relevant in in some ways to uh, to some of the bigger urban environments and some of the bigger um, challenges that the industry is going to face, as you say, sort of you know September onwards when more people. Uh, uh, start to uh, to to need to travel for um, education apart from anything else. I think that's going to be uh, an interesting one. And so, um, you know, the the more regular bus routes will, uh, I expect, start to get busier. And so, um, this sort of solution will uh, will need to be uh, thought about uh, a bit more. Um, so, uh, thank you for that. Um, We've not had any uh, questions in, um, so um, I will. Um, and given the uh, given the time, um, start to um, wrap up. Um, so we um, thank you for to all of the. Um, speakers um today um it's been a fascinating uh, look at what's going on and the and the big differences and the approaches that that people are taking so hopefully um it's given people a good idea of uh, of what's going on uh, across the country and if they're needing to look at things um some of the uh, some of the options and challenges that uh, that are going to be out there um, we are um, off the back of this um, session um, going to have um, a follow-up session in a couple of weeks 
um, looking at some of the technology behind it. Um, we've heard today you know, the, the business side of things and the customer experience side of things, but uh, of even before um, this session started, there were people asking um, about how it all hung together in the back end and things like that. So, uh, so we'll have a, uh, an, a, a more technical session um, in a couple of weeks. Um, and um, we'll carry on having um, uh, COVID -E type related um, webinars um, uh, throughout the autumn. Um, we are um, next week um, starting a series on data standards um, with uh, with Bus Open Data Program. Um, starting to work uh, to really sort of um, kick off. Um, there's a lot of interest and a lot of people that haven't really used public transport data standards before um, that could do with um, some more information to uh, to help them make best use of uh, of the data that's becoming available. So, uh, so we're starting a series um, on that. Um, next week and then we'll go on and look at things like NAPTAN and Trans Exchange and, and Siri um, in uh, in following uh, weeks. Um, so um, just to uh, to end, um, thank you everybody, all the speakers again and thank you for um, attending um, and thank you for your uh, questions. Um, please do feel free to uh, to get in touch um, afterwards um, if we've not uh, been able to, uh, to to deal with your question or you've thought about it um, afterwards um, the slides from today um, will be uh, being made available um, and the recording will be on uh, on YouTube and the Arctic website um, probably tomorrow okay. Thank you very much, everybody. Thanks, Tim. Thank you for watching this Artig webinar. To find out more about Artig and our work, then please visit our website at rtig.org.uk. Thank you. Mm -hmm.